many of you are fans of Ghostbusters. Oh, I don't mean the movie, I mean the TV show. You see, years ago, there was a TV show called Ghostbusters way before Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd put on their ghost protection backpacks. He was also on a wildly successful TV show called f He also would appear on all the variety shows at the time, doing imitations and wild accents. He would appear in movies, millions of movies, doing the most eccentric, crazy characters. And ladies and gentlemen, we have him here today. A man who also appeared in a movie that's a favorite of mine, The Aristocrats. So ladies and gentlemen, the great Larry Storch. So here, with the star of F Troop, and more importantly, the star of Ghostbusters. (laughs) The original Ghostbusters. The original Ghostbusters. (laughs) Way before uh, Bill Murray or Dan Aykroyd, the original Ghostbusters, and my co-star in The Aristocrats. This man was in The Aristocrats. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my good friend, Larry Storch. Thank you so much, and very glad to be with all of you. Uh, Fire away anything I can help you with. Why? Fire away. Go ahead. (laughs) Now, you were, I think, discovered by, uh, like, a comic actress, a great comic actress. Uh, oh, Lucille Ball? Yes. Oh, Lucille Ball was, is my fairy godmother. She, uh, f- right after the war was over, I was hitchhiking home to uh, New York in my uniform, and in those days... You had no trouble at all if you were in uniform with that thumb up in the air wanting a lift. And so happened that Phil Harris picked me up, and he was driving to Palm Springs. And he said, well, what do you do, kid? I said, I'm going to try to get back into show business. What do you do? Voices. Oh, yeah. Who do you do? Well, I did uh, Frank Morgan, who was very popular in those days. <laughs> and, uh, oh, Jimmy Cagney, you dirty rat. I'm going to give it to you just like you know, and the Cary Grants and all that stuff. Well, he turned the car around, and he came back, and I said, no, 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 I want to go to New York. No, no, kid, you're coming back to Hollywood with me. (laughs) And he took me to Cyril's nightclub, and Lucille Ball was sitting in the corner, an empty nightclub, and her husband, Desi Arnaz, was going to open the next night, and Phil Harris said, do a couple of voices for Lucille. I did. She said... Get out of the sailor suit. <laughs> Be here tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Get yourself a, a, a blue suit. And the show starts at 8. And that was the beginning of, uh, of uh, a, a new start after the war. And Lucille Ball did it all. And, and Phil Harris. Uh, oh, people, boy, uh, I loved him. He was a, a regular in the Jack Benny show. Of course. And, and he sang uh, Bare Necessities. In the in Jungle Book. In Jungle. That's right. <laughs> That's right. In Jungle Book. And he was a great entertainer. And now, speaking of World War II, you were on a submarine with who? Tony Car- Submarine Tender. That's a, that's a ship that can repair submarines in the middle of the ocean. And it was called the Proteus. And uh, I told him that I'd been in, in show business, and he said to me, I'm going to be a great star someday. I'm going to be a great actor someday. And I said, now listen, kid, do you like starving? <laughs> do you think you'd like that? Could you get used to it? And uh, why? I said, listen, it's a tough racket. And uh, if you need any help at the end of this war, you can always find me in variety. <laughs> if you need any help at all, call me. Well, don't you know, about two years later, I'm on the phone. Hey, Tony, it's me. It's Larry. Have you got anything out there for me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, he did. I, it, was good. it was a play that I was in called Who Was That Lady? I do Russian 
a character in this play, and he, uh, he need Russian <laughs> for the motion picture, so he, he gave me a job in, uh, in uh, Hollywood, uh, <laughs> just by, well, here and I'm advising him, get out of the racket. <laughs> and and you, you if made, you need any help, call me. You made how many movies with Tony Curtis? You, 40 Pounds of Trouble, Who Was That Lady, The Great Race, several. I mean, he gave you more than one. Uh, oh yeah, I leg didn't up. need. I didn't need an agent when Tony Curtis was was looking was looking out for me. You know, I love that boy really. We should say too that uh, Gilbert and I are sitting in in, in Larry's apartment, uh, a block from where he grew up, and he's showing us some art that Tony did, uh, a caricature that Tony did, or a, a portrait that Tony did from the set of The Great Race in 1964. Yeah, a great drawing of Larry Storch and not, by not, Tony Curtis. Yeah, and I guess not a lot of people know that, that Tony was an artist. Oh, indeed he was. Indeed he was. And uh, when, uh, when, when, we, when he wasn't fighting a war, he was, do, he was doing his artwork. <laughs> now, yeah. now, you also, uh, Larry sh- uh, gave me a tour of his apartment, and you showed me a towel by the wall... And you, okay, first of all, tell, would you mind telling the audience uh, your age? I'm 91. You're 91. 91. And and what is that towel for? You told me that uh, is on the floor by the wall that you do every day. Oh, that's for a uh, yoga. That's uh, I. Uh, About that. I uh, I stand on my head every day for uh, for 10 minutes. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> The, doc, the doctor said to me, well, don't quit then. If you're, I mean, if you're, <laughs> it's, it's a blessing to be in the 90s. He said, uh, watch it very carefully. To be over 90 is a blessing. And I guess it must be, you know. And I'm very happy to, uh, to, be, to still be around. <laughs> How long have you been standing on your head, Lar? Oh, it's got to be uh, when I first started. I was about 20, in my early 20s. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. Every day for 70 plus years, you've been standing on your head yeah. on a towel. Yeah. Incredible. Wow. I, 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 I could barely walk into your apartment. <laughs> Gil, Gil, Gilbert needed four people to carry him into the dining room. Yes, I needed help getting on the <laughs> elevator. Now, also, uh, you, you were friends with Buddy Hackett. Yes, and, and you once told Buddy Hackett that you were thinking of going to drama school. Well, Buddy Hackett said, drama school? Listen, that's like trying to, to learn to drive a car in your garage. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy Hackett, he was one of the, I love that boy. And he used to call you. Buddy Hackett, he would call any time, day or night. Three o'clock in the morning, my phone rings. He <laughs> says, Hey, Sarge, you can't sleep either, huh? <laughs> Sarge, you know who this is? I said, Yeah, it's Hackett. He said, How can you guess? <laughs> How could you miss it? <laughs> How could you miss him? And you grew up with. Don Adams, Maxwell Smart from Get Smart. Right. You were like little kids playing together? That's right. We, were, we lived practically on the same block. And so we did. We grew up together. One block from here, from where, we, from where we're speaking from now. That's right. 77th yeah. Street. 77th Street. That's great. So. And, and later you worked with Don Adams. And many, yes, many times. On, on Get Smart. And yeah. in Tennessee Tuxedo, where you were the yeah. voice of Mr. Whoopi. That's right, yeah. Listen, oh, that was Frank Morgan was uh, Mr. Whoopi. And I remember doing uh, a show with Frank Morgan on the West Coast. And over the loudspeaker just before we said action, someone over the loudspeaker said, Mr. Morgan, your fly is open. What was that? Your fly is open, Mr. Morgan. And Frank Morgan said, oh, well, my flies. Well, as the great Russian Khan once said, in the house of the dead, let all the windows be open. <laughs> I, I used, when I was a kid, I used to watch Tennessee Tuxedo. 
And what was his sidekick, the walrus, his name? Chumley. Chumley. That's right. Wow. That may have been the first time I, I was exposed to Larry Storch, before F Troop, probably Tennessee Tuxedo. Or, or Get Smart, speaking of Don Adams, when you played a villain on the show, you played the groovy guru. Yeah. And we talked about it. I took a, I took a, a Louis Primo, <laughs> and I did him for the guru, the groovy guru. And, uh, and finally, at the end of the whole thing, is, uh, Don Adams said, I know who you're, you're doing Louis Prima. I said, yeah, don't let it get around, you know. <laughs> keep, keep the lid on it. <laughs> now, and, and um, yeah, Louis Prima, that was uh, decades before David Lee Roth sang Just a Gigolo. That was his Just a Gigolo, hit. everywhere I go, people know the bottom for it. Paid for every dance, still in each romance, every night a heartbeat. Yeah, Louis, Louis made that song famous. <laughs> <laughs> and now, F Troop, and and uh, we uh, both, uh, me and Frank, uh, grew up watching F Troop. In fact, we were singing the theme song on your balcony, yes. Larry. Full yeah. disclosure. <laughs> The end of the Civil War was near when quite accidentally... A hero who sneezed, abruptly sneezed, retreat, and reversed into victory. Do you remember this? Sure, of course. Where Indian fights are colorful sights and nobody takes a licking. Pale face and red skin both turn chicken. Good. (laughs) That's great. Wow, to think I'd be hearing you sing that. <laughs> I know I ought to charge for that. <laughs> yeah. The end of the Civil War was near when quite accidentally a hero who sneezed abruptly seized retreat and reversed it to victory. His medal of honor pleased and thrilled his proud little family group. It on some blood was spilled, and so it was planned he'd command F Troop. Where Indian fights are colorful sights, and nobody takes a lickin'. Where pale face and red skin both turn chicken. When drilling and fighting get them down, they know their morale can't droop. As long as they all relax in town before they resume with a bang and a boom. F Troop! Uh, on that, you worked with Forrest Tucker. Yes. Now, if I can get into some uh, more lascivious... Oh, watch it, Larry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Forrest Tucker, I heard, was famous for something Milton Berle was famous for. They both stole jokes? No. <laughs> <laughs> Am I close? <laughs> no, but that was a great answer. <laughs> I heard they were supposed to, both, Milton Berle was known to be uh, uh, quite well endowed. And? Yeah. (laughs) And I heard Forrest Tucker was the other one. No, I was never allowed in the the room. (laughs) So, uh, I mean, I believe you if you find me so. Now, did you know Forrest Tucker before F Troop? No. When I auditioned, uh, Tucker took, the, took some producer aside and the direct, and said, I want Larry to be in, in my partner in F Troop. And they, they said, all right, if that's what you want. And it worked out. Because on F Troop... <clears throat> Watching the two of you, you worked like an old-time comedy team. Yeah. And to look at the two of you, you looked like you had been doing this for years on the road. 
Yeah, the timing was great. The zip refs. It, it was like an Abbott and Costello, uh, the way you and After you work with somebody like that for quite a while, you really, it's, 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 a, it's almost like a marriage of, uh, of, of, of actors, you know. And uh, we got along great, and uh, I, I, I could never have made it without him. Really. Yeah, he was like, it was a classic comedy team because Forrest Tucker was classic straight man oh, yeah. and you were like this silly, uh, goofy Agarn. Been in your rifle, Sarge? Yeah. <laughs> you don't fool me. What? Go ahead, shoot! Give it to me right here! <laughs> what are you talking about? I heard you talking to the doctor about me. You said maybe you should put me out of my misery. I can't stand the suspense. Go ahead, shoot! <laughs> talking about you. I know I'm a goner. I can't stand the suspense. Shoot! I don't even need a blindfold. Just a condemned man's dinner, chicken, peas, watermelon. Wait! Hold the peas. You got candied yams? <laughs> candied yams? Sure. You wouldn't refuse a man his last request? What are you talking about, last request? You got nothing to worry about. I didn't mention you in the letter. Letter? What letter? I had to do it. I got to leave this earth with a clear conscience. I told him about all the deals we made and the, the swindles. But I took the blame, Sarge. I didn't mention you. I may have black tongue and a loose teeth, but I got a clear conscience. Black tongue. Loose teeth. That was my horse we were talking about. <laughs> your horse? What do you mean, your horse? The vet said my horse is very sick. He hasn't got a chance. Now, what about the letter? What about me? You're fine. You're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. You're fine. But what about the letter? I'm fine. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Oh, that's marvelous for me. Very bad for the horse. <laughs> Never mind the horse. What about the letter? Oh, the letter is all right. I just mailed it to the inspector general. <laughs> the Inspector General. And uh, now, and F Troop had a great cast. We sure did. Uh, the Indian chief was a fellow named Frank DeCova. Now, Frank DeCova was Italian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he played Wild Eagle. Yes. That's right. right. And. Uh, he liked to, uh, he could rehearse his lines in Italian, <laughs> which was wonderful. <laughs> you know. and, uh, could, you, could you demonstrate him doing his lines in Italian? No, I really can't. <laughs> uh, just, to, just to digress a yeah, little yes. bit. Uh, my favorite actor was always, uh, one of them was, I thought Marlon Brando was, oh, was, was the, the greatest. And when I heard... The Marlon Brando doing Don Corleone, the head of the mafia. I thought, boy, that sounds like some of the guys, some of the bosses that I've worked for in nightclubs all over the, all over the country. Wow. When I first opened up at the Copacabana, oh, I was on the bill with Frank Sinatra. And I remember when I first came into the rehearse, somebody met me at the door and I said, I'm... I'm here to rehearse uh, some some uh, some jokes, and he said, "This guy said to me, Nick Kelly. He called himself Nick Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Kelly. He said, listen, kid, the jokes will take care of themselves. Can you drive a car?'" <laughs> I said, "Yeah. You know New Jersey." I said, no, but if someone is sitting on the right-hand side, it says, take a left, take a right, take... Yeah, I know New Jersey. All right, you just be ready to drive. You know, that kind of <laughs> stuff. At the, at the, in those days, the, uh, the mob ran the Copacabana. And I heard the mob was actually... All performers around that time said the mob was really nice to them. Oh, they, they were. You know, everybody thinks if your jokes don't go, they sit in the front going, get da 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 <laughs> you know. But no, these guys were the nicest bosses I ever worked for in my life. Yeah, I heard that. Like, it, throughout Vegas and everything, they, 
like Martin and Lewis loved uh, working for the mobsters. I so and so did I. I uh, I uh, I worked for them regularly in Vegas and at the Copacabana. So uh, I really am uh, I'm in their debt. <laughs> Did you ever hear weird stories about the mobsters, stuff that they kept out of the press? No, I, I can't say that I did. I, I wish I could, but I didn't. Yeah, well, you can't say it now because they're all dead, so you can safely say Larry, did you start in, in, in burlesque houses? Is that where, where it sort of all began? <laughs> I was going, I was in high school, and there was an act in the downtown called the Radio Rogues, mm -hmm. Hell's a Poppin' at the Winter Garden Theater. Someone took me backstage and said uh, to these three guys, Jimmy Hollywood, Ed Bartell. And Jimmy Hollywood. Jimmy Hollywood. I love it. And Sidney Chatton. They said, listen, this kid can do all kinds of impersonations. Anyway, they were at the Paramount Theater, and I'm in high school at, at uh, Dewitt Clinton. One of them gets ill at the Paramount Theater. Can you fill in for him? I'm going to high school. Never mind high school. They'll get along without you. Can you <laughs> fill in at the Paramount Theater? Well, I took three days off. I, I, I don't think I even told my mother. I would go down every day to the Paramount Theater and fill in for Sidney Chatton, it was. And finally, the principal called my mother and me to, to high school. Why hasn't he been to school? And uh, my mother said he's been at the Paramount Theater. And that was my first, first job in front of people. Not in a mind ago, but the Paramount Theater. Well, I couldn't get over it. I thought I'd, I'd gone to heaven. And I said to my mother, oh, by the way, the principal said his record is lousy. You know, let him go, let him go if he wants to get out and he'll learn his craft. And, uh, and that's what I did. I, I quit high school and I went to work uh, in, 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 in showbiz. So the principal basically encouraged you. Yeah, he said, said let him go. He, <laughs> his record is lousy. <laughs> so he told you to drop out. That's right, yeah, he encouraged it. <laughs> and go into showbiz. And my mother was all tearful. Oh, he can't, he can't, he, he can't do that. <laughs> Lady, it's going to be helpful to him. And so I did. I dropped out of a high school and I went right to work. Getting back to F Troop, you and Forrest Tucker became friends after that. Yeah, yes. Oh, the, the closest of friends. He would dr drive into a, a nightclub where I was working and uh, sit in the front row and laugh as though he'd never heard that, that there was jokes before, you know. And so, yes, we were the very best of friends. And I heard a story that a director tried directing the two of you and something Forrest Tucker said to them. He said that, uh, he goes, don't direct us. I'm too old and Larry's too stupid. <laughs> That's the nicest thing he could have said. <laughs> and it's practically, and it's, uh, and in those days, it was probably true. Well, well, Agarn's catchphrase on the show, if there was one, was, who says I'm dumb? Who says I'm dumb? Right. This is after 30 minutes. <laughs> right. Who says I'm dumb? Yes. And everybody was on F Troop, Larry. I mean, uh, Milton Berle, Harvey Korman, Phil Harris we talked about, Edward Everett Horton, Don Rickles played Bald Eagle. A any memories, specific memories of any of these oh, guys? Uh, who was that? Oh, my word. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, Edward Everett Hall. Yeah. Oh, yes. He said, oh, my word, <laughs> Larry, promise me something. I said, anything. Promise me you'll never grow old. <laughs> you know? And, <laughs> and uh, one day, Edward Everett Horton's, his voice, he was, he was ill, and I did uh, his voice. Uh, I did his voice, that's all I can tell you. Now, there was an actor on F Troop and, you know, one of my favorite movies was of Mice and Men. Was and, it Joe Brooks who played Vanderbilt? Oh, I... The nearsighted... Uh, no, no, no. Oh, there I was, know who you're talking which, about, the old Western actor. Yes, uh, yes. He played Duffy. Yes. Is there any way anyone can look that up? Uh, was it Bob Steele? Yes. Bob, what, Bob Steele? Yeah. Bob Steele oh, was in the original of Mice and Men with Lon right. Chaney Jr. I just have to tell you just this one... Do we have time for a fast one? Plenty, Absolutely. Plenty of time. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> it's a, a wedding, what do you, uh, a Mormon wedding in a little town called Dribble Creek, Utah. And Leroy Hotchkiss was going to marry nine women that morning that he'd had his eye on. And the preacher started the wedding and he said, do you, Leroy Hotchkiss, take these nine women to be your lawful wedded wives? And he said, I do. And he said, and do you girls, do you girls take Leroy Hotchkiss to be your lawful wedded husband? And they said, we do. And the preacher said, some of you girls in back better talk up if you want to get in on this. <laughs> That's a great one. I love that. Now, you told a version of the aristocrat in, with an English accent. Do you know about the family who goes into the talent agent's office? Well, actually, when the curtain rises, there we are on stage, me, my two daughters, my wife, and a gorilla named Daisy from the Belgian Congo. My daughter pulls my index finger, at which point I let out a thunderous fart. My wife does a very sexy striptease dance on a tom-tom. Following that, I have a violent love affair with a gorilla daisy, if you know what I mean. But have no fear. If there are any children, they'll be brought up as Catholics. Well, I did quite a few English uh, a dialect. I mean, I like, I like doing Cockney myself. You know, I mean, it's got more colour, and uh, I could have got more work if I'd let them all know that I can do Cockney, you know. <laughs> and I love, who was it? Was it, did Humpty Dumpty fall off the wall, or was he pushed? You know, <laughs> so I, I love doing uh, English dialects. Where did all the dialects and the accents come from, Larry? Because my, I've, heard, I've heard you say you wouldn't have worked so much if it hadn't been for that skill. My mother ran a, a rooming house on 77th, right up the block, mm -hmm. for starving actors. It, it, she didn't plan it that way, but, they, you know, in those days you could starve, which, <laughs> which a lot of them did. And anyway, the phone was on the very main floor, and these actors from Germany, from France, from England... And I could hear them hear those dialects every day over the phone. And I would come into my mother and say, Mom, does he sound like this? And I'd do the dialect with whoever it was. And so I learned doing dialects with all these starring actors in, the, in my house, you know. And, uh, and that's how I got most of my jobs, because I could do the dialects. I, I mean, I remember you on TV in those days. You were a great impressionist. I, I love doing impressions, impersonations, you know, Claude Rains and all those fellows. And uh, so, uh, yes, I, can, I did. Can you do a Claude Rains from in Well, Claude Rains who spoke, you know, he was more or less on that, uh, that style. Claude Rains, was, you know. And uh, I, can't, I don't hit them right on the head anymore, <laughs> you know. But, uh, but the dialects, uh, but the English dialect always entranced me. Now, back then, it seemed like everybody on TV would do a Cary Grant imitation, <laughs> and everybody, it seemed like, like it was already accepted that Cary Grant would always go, Judy, Judy, Judy. Well, now I was working at the Trunk of Dara nightclub. <laughs> And while I was on the floor, a waiter came up on the, on the floor and he whispered in my ear, Judy Garland has just walked in. And I didn't know what to say. And I, just, I was doing Cary Grant and I said, Judy, 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 you know. I didn't know what else to say. So I just said, Judy. And somehow or other it caught on. And the rest is uh, history, I guess. It's just believed. It's Hollywood legend now that somehow Cary Grant said, Judy, Judy, Judy. And it's Larry Storch yes. that said, Judy, Judy, Judy. Yes, right. <laughs> now, you, and you said that Cary Grant once said, uh, admitted that he never said, Judy, Judy, he Judy. Said, you, he said, I did say, you dirty rat. <laughs> he said, but I never said, Judy, Judy, Judy. Of course, you dirty rats was what everybody who did a Cagney imitation said. You dirty rat. I'm going to give it to you just like you gave it to my brother. You know, that, that sort of thing. 
And uh, so, yeah, I got away with that. With that. Yeah, because everyone who did James Cagney would say, you dirty rat. <laughs> and he never said it. I remember no. John Biner doing a great uh, Jimmy Cagney. Remember John oh, Biner? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I, I worked with John Biner. And um, a lot of the TV that you did in the in the '60s, Larry, a lot of stuff. I mean, you were you were in the '50s. I mean, you were you were Charlie the Drunk on Car 54. Where are you? I mean, I saw you when I was a kid. As on I Dream of Genie, I remember you played a chimpanzee. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, could you talk about it? Yeah, well, well keep keep the, the lid on that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I, was going to, I did. I played the chimpanzee. I spent three days up in the, the top of a tree with a chimpanzee, and they said, do everything that the chimp does. Try to imitate the And you, the night before I did the chimpanzee, the director put his arm around me and he said, I want you to go home tonight and find the inner chimpanzee in you. <laughs> find, you know. <laughs> we should explain. It was, a, it was a chimp that was working in the NASA program, and... As I recall, Genie brought the chimp to life, and you were the you were the human persona, the human personific- the personification <laughs> of the chimpanzee. It was a very intelligent script. <laughs> well, I I sat on that tree for three days with the chimpanzee, <laughs> and I said, "Do do it just like the chimp." Was he at least a nice chimp? Oh yeah, we got along really well. <laughs> <laughs> now. Then, uh, like I said before, uh, way before anyone knew who Bill Murray or Dan Aykroyd was, you starred in Ghostbusters. We're the Ghostbusters. I'm Spencer. He's Tracy. I'm Bone. We're the Ghostbusters. We're clever, courageous, and strong. Your sleep has been haunted with whispers and rattlings. Your blood has been curdled. We know what to do. Your skin has the creepies. I wonder what's happening. You're safe in our hands. We will take care of you. The Ghostbusters, spirits and demons, beware. The Ghostbusters, wherever you're hiding, I'm we know what you're up to, we're ready for anything, we're bold and we're fearless, and never afraid, we're always prepared, we're right there with every the sound of the job, struggle soon pain, the Ghostbusters do it again. Well, we, yes, well, we only did two, two episodes of Ghostbusters, if I remember right. And you know, the, uh, the gorilla was Bob Burns. Yes. Now, I didn't know him at all. And I didn't recognize him when he took his gorilla suit off. I didn't know who <laughs> I was talking to. It was only when he climbed into his gorilla suit that, ah that I knew who I was talking to. <laughs> you know. It was you and Forrest Tucker, right? Yes. Yeah. And you and Forrest Tucker sang the theme song. To Ghostbusters. It, it, it was a pretty horrible thing. <laughs> but to hear you and Forrest Tucker sing. Now, do you remember what the name of your uh, organization was? Spencer Tracy and, and Kong. Kong. That's right, Spencer Tracy and Kong. That's great. Yeah, I know. Uh, Bob Burns is like a massive he he specializes in gorilla suits he always and he's a massive collector of old horror before rick baker became the master yes, of the gorilla yes, suit it was yes. Bob Burns. <laughs> I, see. I see i didn't realize that <laughs> Larry, you did a lot of variety shows, too. and You did Sonny and Cher and Laughing and Hollywood Squares and Playboy After Dark and, and Hollywood Palace and The Tonight Show and The Sullivan Show and The Steve Allen Show. Any, any particular memories about Steve Allen or, or Sullivan or Jackie Gleason? Jackie Gleason? I, Jackie Gleason gave me the show in 1950, and he said, Larry, I'm going to leave Art Carney with you. He said, we're on live. Thousands of people are watching, not millions. In those days, we couldn't get used to the idea that millions 
one. Thousands of people are watching. We're on live. So just don't say, mm, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we're on live. And um, anyway, they, he said that, you know, they asked me, what did I think was good in bed? I don't know what's good in bed. To me, when the three of us don't fight, that's good in bed. What was Gleason like, Larry? Because we've well, heard he, conflicting stories from well, different people. Well, he was very nice to me. Mm-hmm. He was, and he had a, you know, he had a great memory. He, but someone told me that he rehearsed by himself his lines in the, all by himself, so that he would he, he would really get the reputation of of having a, a very sharp memory. But he he that's the way he did it. Mm-hmm. Now now uh, was Jackie Gleason a good boss to have? I only I only met him just that that one uh, one or two days, but yes, he was very nice to me. Yes. Now, oh, I now with speaking, getting back to Bob Burns, uh, Larry Storch and Bob Burns will be doing Son of Monster Palooza. Wow! In September, in the Rubber Room. We've what? been handed a plug. Yes. <laughs> You're working with that, Bob Burns again. A plug that you don't know about. <laughs> a plug that's news You're, to Larry. The, yes. The only person who doesn't know about this is Larry. <laughs> who's going, So you're going to have to pick out a shirt to wear. <laughs> okay. I, it, was, it was just that to me. <laughs> Okay. Now, you had a great John Barrymore story. John Barrymore was in court, and uh, they said, hand on the Bible, your name, occupation. And John Barrymore said, my name is John Barrymore. My occupation, I'm the world's greatest actor. After the trial is over, he went out, in, uh, he left the courtroom, and his sister and brother, Ethel and Lionel, jumped on him, and they said to him, how dare you say a thing like that, that I'm the worst? How could you say a thing like that? And John Barrymore said, remember, Ethel? I was under oath. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. <laughs> now, you must do an Ed Sullivan Imitation on our show, on our show tonight. Let's really hear it out there for Will Jordan, who's going to do a great impersonation of me. And anyway, I was doing this in a show, and I, I completely forgot that I was in the show. I was breaking the fourth wall. The audience started to laugh, and I thought I was in a nightclub again. But here I was on stage, and the audience was laughing, and I, I kind of turned away and yeah, broke the fourth wall. You know, you're not supposed to look like you're in a nightclub if you're <laughs> on stage. And uh, Annie Mira, God bless her, she gave me hell for it. You know, I, I deserved it, too, and I never did it again. Do you remember the name of the show? Uh, it was called After Play. And After it, Play. Yeah, and it was in New Brunswick, in New Jersey. You did a lot of theater. You did Sly Fox with Richard Dreyfus. You did, yes. you did, and you were, in, uh, Gilbert and I are fans of Arsenic and Old Lace. And of course, Karloff was in the original oh, uh, Arsenic and Old Lace. And uh, you, play, did you play Professor Einstein, Dr. Einstein? I was Einstein in that one, yes. To Abe Vigoda's. Abe Vigoda. Was he your, uh, your sidekick? Oh, God. Was he Jonathan, the, uh, the, uh, the Karloff character? No, who was Dita? Oh, I can't remember. But no, I Gene can't. Stapleton was in the show? Gene Stapleton was in the show, quite right. And uh, I had a wonderful time on that one. What was the name of it again? Arsenic uh, and Arsenic Old Lace. And Old Lace. I, I yeah. just got inside information <laughs> <laughs> that it was... Jonathan Frid. Jonathan Frid. From wow. the Dark Shadows. Who just passed Bar- away. Uh, yeah, Barnabas That's in right. Dark Shadows. Right. Another favorite of mine <clears throat> when I was a kid. Because it was a soap opera with monsters. <laughs> so you played the Peter Laurie part. The, 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 the Peter Laurie played the part in the film with Cary Grant. Right, That right. Frank Capra directed, and you were in the stage version. 
Right. You played right. Dr. Einstein. Did you do a special voice for that, do you remember? It was German, but I don't remember the exact uh, voice, uh, uh, tone. I, but it was a German accent that I used. And uh, c- can I tell you a fast joke? Of course. Oh, sure. <laughs> this, this, uh, tell us a slow joke. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't have to tell a joke. Did you hear those laughs? <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, let's hear it. Yes, please. Oh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a director in Hollywood, a very famous director, a very wealthy director, but he had one bad habit. He was a kleptomaniac, and as wealthy as he was, he couldn't refrain from... Uh, he was a, a victim of it. And so they brought a, a, a professor from uh, Dr. Egelhoff from Berlin to help uh, cure this uh, director of uh, kleptomania, and after uh, two weeks of intense uh, uh, treatment of kleptomania, this German professor, Dr. Egelhoff, says, you are absolutely cured of kleptomania. You can be sure uh, that you will never again fall victim to kleptomania. (laughs) Oh, by the way, if you feel a relapse coming on, Pick up a toaster for me. <laughs> That's a great joke. What are some of your favorite jokes? Do you remember some? Oh, they might be too long to tell. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a great one. I saw uh, Larry recently. Uh, we should say that a mutual friend of Gilbert's and mine is Drew Friedman, who, uh, oh. who did the wonderful portrait of you at the Society of Illustrators. And we saw you there. And you told a joke, if, uh, if I can uh, get you to tell it again, it was the joke about the Arab and the Israeli guy oh, on the plane. All right, can we, can we do this? <laughs> sure. All right. It's a, a transatlantic flight to the troubled Middle East, to the explosive Middle East. And seated on the plane next to each other, an Arab and an Israeli. It's very cold, very cold. And they wrap blankets around themselves they take their shoes off, and they, they're flying. And at one point, the Arab turns to the Israeli and he said, would you, my friend from Israel, find the goodness in your heart to go to the back of the plane and bring for me back, please, an orange juice? Since you are seated on the aisle, the Jewish guy says, my Arab friend, it will be by me my pleasure. I shall be back in two shakes, have a lamb's tail. <laughs> Goes to the back of the plane, comes back with the juice. The Arab drinks down all the juice. And then he says to the Jewish guy, while you are gone, I spit in your shoe. The Jewish guy says, <laughs> spit in the shoe, piss in the juice. When will it end? <laughs> It's a wonderful joke. Larry, you do all kinds of dialects and all kinds of accents. If we threw some at you just generally, if we said, you know, uh, Indian, like the character you did in SOB. Oh, Indian. Well, I I do it to Indians all right. General George Armstrong Custer at the banks of the little Bighorn River the night before the great Indian battle. And on the other side of the little Bighorn River were the great, was a hundred thousands of Indians and the great chiefs, Spitting Bull, Geronimo, Crazy Horse, and of course the, the Indian drums. You boom, 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 boom. And George Armstrong Custer said, drums, drums, I don't like the sound of those drums. And from across the river, an Indian hollered back, he ain't no regular drummer. (laughs) (laughs) Terrific. Any joke with an Italian accent? An Italian accent. 
No, I was I was always afraid of the, to tell an Italian joke because when I worked for the mafia, you never knew, you know, I was going to. So uh, if I think of one along the way, I'll, I'll okay. pop it in. How about Swedish? You do a Swedish accent or a, or a uh, Swiss? Well, I, I was doing Swede. I can do that, I but I don't have any. That wasn't a very popular dialect uh, with, with Americans, you know. Right, right. <laughs> oh, did I do a Spanish joke for you? No, no, no please. <laughs> this, this, this was. <laughs> this was a, a, a. It was <laughs> a young person. It is this in Spanish Harlem. A young person on Monday morning takes his two fingers and he puts them in his eyes and he says, Mama, I don't want to go all day, Mama. I don't want to go to school today, Mama. I don't like the kids and I don't like the teachers. I don't want to go to school today, Mama. And his mama says, Jesus, don't you give me that crap. You going to school today. You're 31 years old and you're the principal. <laughs> now, any other jokes with a Jewish accent? With a Jewish accent. Yeah. One time at a very elegant party, <laughs> at a very elegant party on the east side, uh, while the party is, in, uh, is going on, Mozart. Uh, is being played in the background. And as the party ends and Mozart dines, I just one woman says, Mozart, I know that boy. <laughs> I know that boy. I see him every morning. He takes the number five bus to the beach. As they're driving home that night, the husband can contain himself no longer. And he says, you had to, you had to open up your damn fresh. That means mouth. <laughs> You had to open your damn fresh. Let everybody know how stupid you are. You know the number five bus doesn't go to the beach. <laughs> Beautiful. Do you, have, <laughs> oh. do you have any with a French accent? I <laughs> have <laughs> Not offhand. No. <laughs> if, if I think of something in French, I will. Uh, and um, any other with a Jewish accent? No, I, I'll probably think of something along the way, but but just keep going. <laughs> Larry, l let me ask you about music. You you've been playing the saxophone for years. I love to blow saxophone. Yes. And you still play? I go down to the park with the sax on uh, every morning when it's. When the weather was right, and I blow for a couple of hours down in the park. So you just walk to like what, like Riverside Drive? Or? Yes, quite right. And, and and you just take your sax and you sit you, on a park bench and blow. You said that when you play the saxophone, then you're playing with the gods. You're hobnobbing. They say you're hobnobbing with the gods when you uh, when, when you. Any kind of music at all, as long as you're in music. You're, uh, you're hobnobbing with the gods. What do you remember about the great race, Tony, which we talked about before? With Jack Lemmon. Where you played Texas Jack. We were talking about it. It was one of the film that I'm really, that I've always been in love with. You, you were, it was uh, Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon and Keenan Wynn. And you, you had this wonderful short scene as Texas Jack, this tough guy that comes in and just turns the saloon upside down. Give me some fighting room. Give me some fighting. That's and it. every time he says, give me some, somebody clips him in the jaw and knocks him flat. Right. <laughs> but uh, I did that about eight or nine times. Give me some fighting room. They gave me fighting room. And uh, I kept giving. Kept, kept uh, this is a, a, a visual joke. You can't. You can't. You, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Just a moment. I'm afraid, sir, you have me at a disadvantage. As you can see, I am unarmed. He's unarmed. Let's get the 
this. Not yet. All right, now. Come on, now, everybody. Stand back and give a man some fighting room. <laughs> Stop! Music, somebody! Start the music! <laughs> Dorothy Provine was your, if you guys haven't seen The Great Race, it's, uh, we recommend it. Blake Edwards directed it, and it's a wonderful comedy. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's an homage to, to uh, old movies. I suppose so, yeah. yeah. And, and that's one that Tony Curtis uh, called you in for. Tony was, he was, a, he was like a brother. We were like brothers. He called me on, on every, he, someone said, you don't need an agent as long as Tony Curtis is your friend. And that's the way it was with, uh, with Tony Curtis. Can you do a Tony Curtis imitation? No. <laughs> no, I'm afraid you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, first, I mean, this, this uh, amazes me because here's Larry, 91, and, I, and he said, can we do it this day because I have a plug. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was great. Okay, on Thursday, June 26th at 6 p.m., Larry's friends are throwing a comedy show fundraiser at Stand Up New York to pay for Larry's star on the Palm Springs Walk of Stars. For tickets, visit StandUpNewYork.com or to donate, visit GoFundMe.com slash Storch, Storch Star. Storch's Star. GoFundMe.com slash Storch's Star. So you're going to get a star on the Walk of Fame in Palm Springs. Well, I'm very honored because I'll be... I'll be in there with some great company. So uh, it is a great honor, and I, uh, and I appreciate it. Didn't you receive another uh, honor recently, Larry? You were named the, the, the mayor of Fort Lee, honorary oh, mayor yes. of Fort Lee, New Jersey. I was, um, yeah, I was the mayor. For, and you know, while I was in office... Yeah. <laughs> While I was in office, there was no crime. <laughs> no crime at all. Nothing. No crime. And it, it opens up a new door for me. Is it possible that uh, politics, I could be a great politician, you know? And I, I always think of that, of, the, of Mount Rushmore, with all of the great statesmen. Who is it? Lincoln... Jefferson, Woodrow Wilson. But I also think, just remember, before these, these guys were great statesmen, just remember, baby, they were all politicians. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? They were all politicians, baby. <laughs> I never forgot that. 
do you have any other jokes? We <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Jim. If you want to keep talking, you'll come back to me. <laughs> All right, do the Moses one, coming down. Moses coming down from the mountain with the commandments under his arm. And a million Jewish people meet him. Mo, Mo, you talk with him. Mo, what was it like? Mo, what did you remember? And Moses said to everybody, shut up, all of you. He wanted 13. I got him down to 10. <laughs> Oh, yes. Pussy Green. Oh, that's true. Someone that's, has yelled from the... Uh, that's a long, uh, quite a... From the peanut gallery. It's okay. We got faith. Yeah. Well, <laughs> her name was Pussy Green, do you hear? Red hair. Green eyes. The soul of a monkey. Sex incarnate. And she went through every town, destroying all of those. And finally... One a guy in church, Father, forgive me, Father, it wasn't my fault. It was Pussy Green, Father. Pussy Green, she, I'll, I'll burn in hell. I'll burn in hell, I know I will, Father, I'll burn in hell. At that minute, the church doors open up. It can only be Pussy Green. Lipstick, uh, uh, the, the cigarette dangling from her lips. Red hair and the green eyes, a generous contribution into the poor box, and sashayed down the aisle to the very front row where she sat down, legs akimbo. <laughs> <laughs> the old priest was preaching, and suddenly he saw it. He, oh, he stared and stared, and finally he called a young priest over, and he said, there, is that pussy green? <laughs> and the young priest said, no, Your Eminence, it's just a reflection from the stained glass window. <laughs> and what was the Jesus one? <laughs> Mother Mary. Why does she always look so upset? And all the oh, Christ, Christ walking through the desert comes upon the mob about to stone Mary Magdalene to death. Mary Magdalene, the Jezebel of the Bible. And Christ raised one arm and said, Let him among you who is without sin cast the first stone. And with that, a little gray-haired old lady in back of Christ picked up rocks and started throwing them like a machine gun. Christ turned around, saw and hollered, Ma! <laughs> uh, this has been I, I'm exhausted from laughing I, I am the, Oh, oh. <laughs> two, two cannibals Two cannibals Two cannibals In the jungles of Bujamburu Two cannibals in the jungles of Buju, Bujamburu, both having lunch. <laughs> and one cannibal said to the other, I heard my mother-in-law, a constant woman, I heard her mother-in-law, she make me sick to my stomach. And the other cannibal said, well, screw her, just eat the noodles. <laughs> Do you remember any other of Larry's? <laughs> because I love these. <laughs> we have this, the Larry Storage fan club here. Uh, Sending jokes in from the, from the gallery. Well, okay. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre with the great Larry Storch, star of F Troop, the original Ghostbusters, and most importantly, my co-star in The Aristocrats. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you again. Thank you. It's a treat, Larry. Thanks for doing it. 